so uh, thank you very much, Philip. Um, so this presentation brings together uh, some of the histories of the many vice regal residences across the Commonwealth. I will talk about the role of government houses uh, before we embark on a whirlwind tour of the several of these official residences on different continents. So why government houses? Uh, where did this all begin? Well, I've been interested in British royalty and have been collect collecting memorabilia, uh, books, uh, researching and writing about the royal family for many years. In 2004, I embarked on a gap year in Australia and New Zealand, primarily based in Sydney. I would walk to work through the botanical gardens in Sydney's city centre and walk past this very grand building that I soon discovered was Government House in, in New South Wales. On going inside, I discovered a fascinating world of formal state rooms that often included a throne room and formal reception rooms. The walls were adorned with portraits of kings and queens, past and present, and I was struck by the fact that even though I was thousands of miles away from Buckingham Palace, here was a very real and tangible link with the Crown. Government House was the embodiment of the Crown and the monarch in the many realms and dominions of first the British Empire and then later in the Commonwealth. I began to discover that government houses existed all over the world, in Commonwealth countries and overseas territories. They came in all shapes and sizes and different architectural styles, and they all had one thing in common, their link to the crown and the monarch. So if we look back over the history of firstly the British Empire and then later of the Commonwealth, the official residences of the sovereign's representative in many countries, territories, states and provinces came to be known as government house. Originally, the term government house came to represent the centre of the administrative life of an overseas territory of the British Empire. And the name came to personify both the executive or the administration of the territory, as well as the representation of the head of state. This was usually centred on a single building that housed the official life of the territory that came to be known as Government House. As many countries and territories began to establish separate executives and legislatures in national and state parliaments and in government administration buildings, Government House evolved to represent the place where the sovereign's representative would reside. These official residences were occupied by the resident viceroy, governor, lieutenant governor, commissioner or administrator, and later following the independence of some countries by the governor general. These government houses also played host to the monarch and members of the royal family when they visited. Some official residences were known as the governor's house or even by different names linked to the location of the building or even local place name. In the United States, some official residences of the governor of certain states were known as executive mansions. However, the name of government house came to be widely adopted across the British Empire. At the end of the 19th century, there were well over 120 government houses in all four corners of the world. These official residences and their occupants, occupants were in constant contact with the monarch through the British Foreign and Colonial Office and through written dispatches sent to Buckingham Palace to keep the sovereign up to date with what was happening in their realms and territories. During the 20th century, the British Empire became the Commonwealth and many countries and territories became independent. In many cases, the former government house became known as State House or the President's House as new heads of state were elected and these official residences underwent a transition as the country moved from monarchy to republic. Although many countries also remained members of the Commonwealth. A number of these former viceregal residences retain traces of their historical past and the time when they were government houses of the Crown. Although some residences have disappeared altogether and some have been adopted for different purposes. Today, there are around 50 remaining current government houses of the Commonwealth, each with their own distinctive stories. 
and in this talk I will introduce you to some of these residences. Government houses today can be divided into three main groups. Firstly, in the Commonwealth realms. Each Commonwealth realm is a sovereign state or country that has a constitutional monarch as their head of state that is shared with others but retains a crown legally distinct from other realms. The 1931 Statute of Westminster in the Parliament of the United Kingdom provided for the then dominions at the time Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, the Irish Free State and Newfoundland to have independence as equal members of the Commonwealth of Nations and sharing the same person as their sovereign. By the early 1950s, in order to reflect the equal status of each of the countries in this group, each country became known as a realm. The term was first formally used in the proclamation of Elizabeth II as Queen in 1952. The monarch is represented by a governor general in all realms except for the United Kingdom, and the governor general is appointed by the sovereign on the advice of the ministers of the country concerned, except for Papua New Guinea, where the governor general is elected by the legislature. These governor generals usually reside at government house. In some of the larger Commonwealth realms, which operate a federal system, for example, in Australia um, and in Canada, the sovereign is also represented by a governor or lieutenant governor at the state level. Many of these states and provinces also have a government house, um, and you can see many of them here. Next, we move on to the Crown Dependencies. These are independently administered jurisdictions of the British Crown that do not form part of the United Kingdom or the British Overseas Territories. Each of the Crown Dependencies are defined uniquely and are considered self-governing. Internationally, the Crown Dependencies are not considered to be sovereign states, so they are not individual members of the Commonwealth, although they all have independent legislatures who legislate on local matters, and so they are members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, for example in their own right. The Crown Dependencies also participate independently in the Commonwealth Games and many other Commonwealth organisations. The monarch has a unique and independent relationship with the Crown Dependencies and is represented by a Lieutenant Governor who usually resides at Government House. The Lieutenant Governor is largely a ceremonial and charitable role and carries out duties on behalf of the monarch, such as awarding honours and medals. The three crown dependencies are the bailiwick of Jersey and the bailiwick of Guernsey in the English Channel and the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea. And we can see here their respective government houses. The final group of current government houses can be found in the British Overseas Territories or sometimes known as the United Kingdom's overseas territories. These are 14 territories under the jurisdiction and sovereignty of the UK, although they are internally self-governing territories with their own elected legislatures, currencies and political systems. They are all represented by their own teams at the Commonwealth Games, although they are not currently independent members of the Commonwealth. All of the British overseas territories recognise the British monarch as their head of state and the crown is represented locally by governors or in some cases by commissioners, administrators or residents in these territories. And there are currently 14 British overseas territories of which nine have a current government house um, and you can see some of them here. There are actually another group of overseas territories linked to the Commonwealth um, but uh, are separate from the British Overseas Territories. Um, and these are linked to two Southern Hemisphere countries. So we have um, the Overseas Territory of New Zealand, which uh, is the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands is um, what in what's called a free association with uh, New Zealand, and so comes under the, the realm of New Zealand. And so uh, and the Cook Islands has a, a government house 
uh, and a Queen's representative who lives uh, at Government House in the Cook Islands. The other overseas territory uh, is linked to Australia, uh, and this is Norfolk Island, um, out in the uh, far out in the out in the ocean uh, between uh, I think the, the Tasman Sea between uh, Australia and New Zealand. And Government House in Norfolk Island um, was it built in 1804, one of the oldest in Australia, um, and was actually built at the time when Norfolk Island was a penal co colony. So we now begin our tour of current government houses at the place where I first discovered these viceregal residences in Australia. As the location of the first European settlers to arrive in the country, the city of Sydney and the state of New South Wales have played an important role in the national life and development of Australia on the eastern coast. In many early settlements of the British Empire, the first government house that was built rarely survives today as they were often poorly built temporary structures and subsequent more structurally sound houses often replaced them. The first government house in Sydney was constructed in 1788, although the building itself no longer survives. The current government house is located at the heart of Sydney's Royal Botanic Gardens. Built between 1837 and 1845, the Gothic style Victorian residence has the appearance of a small castle. Government House was designed by Edward Bloor, architect to King William IV and Queen Victoria, and followed the style of his other recent works on the British Houses of Parliament and extensions to Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. Building materials of sandstone, marble and cedar wood were sourced from across New South Wales and it has been the official residence of the Governor of New South Wales since then, apart from two periods of absence. Today, Government House features a significant collection of viceregal furniture, portraits and ornaments acquired by successive governors. A magnificent ballroom with its minstrels gallery features royal portraits and painted ceilings. Further state rooms include a dining room with a table for over 25 guests, and a drawing room featuring, featuring historic portraits and modern Australian artworks. The impressive main hall is decorated with the coats of arms of successive governors, as well as the royal arms and portraits of Queen Elizabeth II. We now move south to Australia's other largest city, Melbourne, and government house in the state of Victoria. At the heart of the city's uh, at the heart of the city's uh, botanic garden is the impressive Government House of Victoria. Built at the highest point of the botanic gardens to the south of the Yarra River, the concept of a government house as a, an official residence for the governor was first conceived in the 1840s under the first Lieutenant Governor of Victoria, Charles Latrobe, who set aside a plot of land for the purpose. However, it was not until the 1870s that the Inspector General of the Public Works was commissioned to draw plans for a fine viceregal residence. He designed an Italian residence, sorry, uh, uh, he designed an Italianate residence said to take its inspiration from the Queen Empress Victoria's summer residence, at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight on the English South Coast with a similar 44 meter high Belvedere tower. And you can see the similarities in these two photographs. The extravagant style of, of government house was said to reflect the prosperous economy in Victoria at the time due to the gold rush that had taken place in the, that particular part of Australia. Government house today is divided into three main wings, the state rooms, the huge ballroom and the private residence. And there are said to be over 240 rooms across the entire estate. It is said to be one of the largest remaining government houses in the Commonwealth. Of particular note is the state ballroom, which itself is an impressive 42 meters long and occupies an entire wing of the house. At the time of the construction of Government House in Melbourne in the 1870s, 
It was reputed to be the biggest ballroom in the entire British Empire, and it is said to be even larger than the state ballroom at Buckingham Palace. It is rumoured that when Queen Victoria was shown the plans for the new government house in Victoria, she disapproved of the size of the ballroom and instructed that a smaller room should be built. However, by the time the Queen's disapproval had been communicated to the architects in Melbourne, the house had already been built. Oops. The peacock blue decor of the ballroom reflects the heraldic colours of the first Governor General of Australia, Lord Hopetown, and the impressive crystal chandeliers were made by ostlers of Birmingham in England. By contrast, we now move from one of the most populated areas of Australia to one of the most sparsely populated in the vast Northern Territory. Government House in Darwin is the official residence of the administrator of the Northern Territory and is one of the oldest European buildings. It was built between 1870 and 1871 and is a mid Victorian house set in hillside gardens in the centre of Darwin's business district and overlooking the harbour. The building's original structure featured a central hall with stone walls and the traditional wraparound veranda, typical of houses of that period in Australia. In 1874, a second story was added, but white ants destroyed it within 12 months, the first of many attacks on the property by the dreaded insects. In 1878, a new residence known as the House of Seven Gables was designed by John George Knight, a prominent local architect who also became the sixth government resident. Made using cypress pine, local porcelainite stone and lime sourced from local coral reefs, the building was completed in 1879. In 1937, one of many cyclones to hit the residence caused widespread damage to the house and later a new bomb shelter was built to double as an office in anticipation of the Second World War. Government House was considered to be at risk at this time due to the strategic position of Darwin in relation to the battles taking place in the Far East. In 1942, during one of the many bombing raids on Darwin, the office at Government House was destro destroyed by a direct hit from Japanese aircraft overhead. One of the maids at Government House, Daisy Martin, was killed in the bomb attack when she was crushed by the rubble and her life is remembered with a plaque in the gardens close to the spot where she died. Today, the residence features many fine examples of local Aborigine artworks and a specially commissioned carpet made of pure Australian wool, embroidered with the Desert Rose and the Northern Territory coat of arms. We now move on to another part of the world where the advent of hurricanes and tropical storms um, across the Caribbean Sea is a constant threat to government houses. The island of Grenada is a Commonwealth realm in the Southeast Caribbean Sea, often known as the Spice Island, due to its exports of locally grown nutmeg and mace. Between 1763 and 1974, the Crown was represented in Grenada by a succession of governors and administrators. When Grenada became independent and a Commonwealth realm in 1974, the sovereign's representative was given the title of Governor General. The official residence of Grenada was Government House for many generations, though little is known about its origins. Initially a wooden house near the main harbour and the capital of St George's, when the British Governor of Grenada arrived in 1784, Government House was later established at the Mount St George estate overlooking the harbour. The estate was purchased at for £20,000 and in the early 1800s, the house was enlarged and extended into a two-storey Georgian villa. Between 1887 and 1888, the government house was remodelled with the addition of an elaborate two-storey veranda. In the 1920s, a further gallery 
was constructed above the veranda. Um, and you can see this at residence in this photograph here. However, after nearly 50 years being largely spared from the destruction uh, and the impact of the many hurricanes uh, that affect the Caribbean region, the island of Grenada was hit by the powerful hurricane Ivan in September 2004. Government house was seriously damaged, leaving an uninhabitable shell of a former residence that had to be abandoned. Today, the governor of Grenada conducts official engagements from a small office in St George's and lives in a property elsewhere on the island. It is hoped that the former government house will one day receive the investment required to restore this historic residence to its former glory. The nearby island of St Lucia is a sovereign nation in the Eastern Caribbean, located north of the larger islands of Barbados and Grenada. The French were the first uh, island settlers um, in 1660, followed in 1664 by Thomas Warner, who settled in St Lucia on behalf of the English. Over the following 150 years, control of St Lucia changed between the French and the British a total of 14 times until 1814, when St Lucia became established as a British settlement, although the French influence remains today through the language, culture and legal practice, which was originally based on the Francophone system. Government House is the official residence of uh, Government House is the official residence of the Governor General of St Lucia, located on a hill known as Morn Fortune, literally Hill of Good Fortune. The first government house built on the site was destroyed by a hurricane before it was completed in 1817. And a second house was built there in 1819. The timber framed house was abandoned in 1865 when it began to deteriorate and the official residence was temporarily moved to a nearby military barracks. Construction of the third and current government house began in 1894 and it was completed a year later. The large brick built house has stood the test of time, although constant repairs and renovations are required. The property is one of the few remaining Victorian buildings on the island and has the appearance of a large family residence, although the flag tower and the royal coat of arms give it a regal air. The spacious official reception rooms feature a small dais with portraits of the monarch and other significant figures and offer commanding views of Castries, which is the capital of St Lucia. Further north in the Caribbean region, the official residence of the Governor General of the Bahamas is this government house, an impressive coral pink Georgian residence completed in 1806. The house replaced a previous residence built in 1737. The steps leading up to the main entrance are dominated by the 12 foot high statue of Christopher Columbus made in 1830 that is said to have been designed in London. The statue was recent, has recently attracted much criticism in the light of the reassessment of statues of historical figures across the world. Government House is located on a 10 acre site in the heart of Nassau. The style of the house was said to have been influenced by the Americans from the southern United States arriving in the islands at the time. And it is similar in design to the, par to the Parliament of the Bahamas, which is also painted in the same distinctive pink colour. The facade of the house was remodelled in the 1930s following extensive hurricane damage in 1929. We move across the Northern Caribbean to the Turks and Caicos Islands, an overseas territory consisting of the, the two groups of islands. The official residence of the governor is located on Grand Turk, and it was named Waterloo after the famous Napoleonic battle of the same name fought in 1815. The same year that the the property was built. 
Its design is in the traditional Bermudan style with one wing and an open air kitchen, characteristic of the Caribbean at the time. In 1857, James Missick, the owner of Waterloo, sold the property for £1,046 to the British government as they had been looking for a residence for the Crown's vice regal representative. Today, the governor's office at Waterloo is one of the most important historical buildings in the islands. It is fortunate that the residence has been well cared for and it has survived fires, termites, remodeling work and major hurricanes four times. Renovations and improvements to Waterloo were commissioned in 1993 to restore as far as possible the original features, including the windows and the property's unusual guttering. We move across the Atlantic Ocean to another overseas territory. The islands of St Helena, Ascension and Tristan da Cunha are collectively a British overseas territory on a series of small volcanic islands in the South Atlantic Ocean. One of the remotest territories in the Commonwealth, until recently the islands were only accessible by ship before a new airport was opened in St Helena in 2016. Plantation House is the official residence of the governor of St Helena and it is located to the south of the capital, Jamestown. The house was built in around 1791 by the East India Company, when the, the company governed the islands before it became a crown colony. The house was chosen as a summer residence for the governor, while the main administration of the island was undertaken from the castle, the governor's town residence in Jamestown. The plantation role of the house, supplying goods and farm produce for the governor and their staff gave the residence its name. The house was extended in 1816, with some further additions in the 1960s, but the main features of this impressive colonial style residence remain unchanged. It has, it has 35 rooms and features a portrait of the Duke of Wellington, who stayed at the residence in 1805 on his way back from India. The library, which contains around 2000 rare books, was one of the original rooms of the house and many illustrious people came to St Helena over the centuries, including Charles Darwin, Rudyard Kipling and Winston Churchill. The roof was originally slate but was replaced with a metal roof like most properties on the island. Previous governors and their families have faced considerable problems with the house, including a period of stagnant water that caused typhoid in the 19th century and termites infesting the property several times in the early 20th century. Today, Plantation House is designated as a Grade 1 listed building. The grounds of over 100 acres are home to several of the world's oldest living tortoises, including Jonathan, who at the grand old age of 187 continues to live in the gardens of Plantation House with five other giant tortoises. The grounds also feature the remains of the so-called ladies bath, a small outdoor pool used by the women of the residents and many rare species of plants and flowers from the island. Further north, Gibraltar is one of the smallest of the British overseas territories located at the southern tip of the Iberian Peninsula and bordered by Spain to the north. The landscape of two and a half square miles is dominated by the Rock of Gibraltar and a densely populated city area, which is home to approximately 30,000 people. Government House, also known as the Convent, has been the official residence of the Governor of Gibraltar since 1728. It was originally a convent of Franciscan friars, hence the name of the residence, and parts of it were built in 1531. After Gibraltar became a British territory in 1713, the Franciscan Friary was taken over as the residence of the governors and has remained so ever since. The building was heavily rebuilt during the 18th and 19th centuries in the Georgian style, 
but there are many features of the residence's ecclesiastical past remaining. The convent's dining room has one of the most extensive displays of heraldry in the Commonwealth, which hang under a vaulted wooden ceiling. The open cloistered courtyard is also used regularly for formal receptions and events, which benefit from the usually hot and sunny Mediterranean weather. We move across to one of the Crown dependencies located in the Channel Islands. As the official residence of the Lieutenant Governor of Guernsey, Government House is located a short drive from the centre of the capital, St Peterport. A large Georgian three-storey whitewashed central residence with two additional wings of the property. Government House has the feel of a sizeable country home without being too grand. Originally known as Le Mans, the present day Government House has been the home of the monarch's representative on the island twice in its history. It was first inhabited by the, the Lieutenant Governor of Guernsey from 1793 to 1796. The property reverted to private ownership, belonging to a succession of Guernsey's wealthiest residents. The Mount, as it was known, became the current Government House again in 1925, when it was purchased by the Crown, and it has been the residence of the Lieutenant Governor ever since except for the period during the Second World War, when it was occupied by the German Army Commandant. We now move back across the Atlantic Ocean to Canada, where there are a number of government houses still in use today. Nova Scotia is one of the three maritime provinces of Canada on the Atlantic coast, and its name derives from the Latin for New Scotland, following its settlement by Scottish traders. The construction of the official residence of Government House is largely credited to one of the earlier governors, Sir John Wentworth, who arrived in Halifax in 1792. He objected to the poor conditions and the green wood and rotting timbers of the old governor's home. Wentworth noted that some of the land purchased by the government for a new legislative assembly building was surplus to requirements and it was considered at the time to be too far from the centre of the capital for the legislature, so he set about commissioning a suitable official residence on the land instead. Government House in Nova Scotia was built between 1799 and 1805, making it one of the oldest continuously occupied official residences in North America. The house was modelled on a Georgian English country residence of the time, with symmetrical windows and chimneys and matching bow wings in the style of the English architect Robert Adam. The architect for Government House was Isaac Hildreth, a Yorkshireman who had emigrated to Virginia in the United States in 1770, where he had furthered his reputation following several successful building projects. Local stone, sand and wood was used in the construction of the house with additional mahogany from South America for the doors and panelling, Scottish slate for the roof and marble fireplace places that were fashioned in London. The house has been refurbished several times in its history, but many origin original features remain. The interior was arranged for formal events and receptions with a large drawing room dining room and ballroom, as well as rooms for the Governor General, for the Lieutenant Governor and their family. Across the Northumberland Straits from Nova Scotia is the Canadian province of Prince Edward Island. The islands were named after Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, the father of Queen Victoria in 1798. The Canadian monarch is represented by the Lieutenant Governor of Prince Edward Island and the official residence is Government House, often known as Fanning Bank in the province's capital city, Charlottetown. Government House was built between 1832 and 1834 on a piece of land known locally as Fanning's Bank that had been set aside in 1789 by then Lieutenant Governor Edmund Fanning for use for future use as the site of a viceregal residence. Part of the site later became the city's Victoria Park. The large Georgian wood-framed house 
is widely acknowledged to have been designed by Yorkshire architect Isaac Smith. Isaac Smith was later to design Province House, which is the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, and both buildings share similar Palladian architectural features, although it is also said that, Georgia, that Government House exhibited characteristics of the Greek revival style that was prevalent in North America at the time. The cost of building Government House was over £3,000 at the time of construction. However, few exterior alterations have been made to the residence since it was built, and so it remains largely unchanged today. We now go to Canada's capital city of Ottawa. The official residence for the Crown in Canada is Rideau Hall. The name Rideau Hall was derived from the nearby Rideau Canal and Rideau Falls, literally Curtain Waterfall. And the name continues today, although the residence is sometimes also referred to as Government House Canada. The original stone villa of Rideau Hall was built in around 1838 and was first inhabited by Scottish stonemason Thomas Mackay and his family, who had bought a large estate outside the settlement, uh, which was then called New Edinburgh and was later to become Ottawa. The residence was known locally as Mackay's Castle. In 1865, major renovations were undertaken to Rideau Hall with the addition of a new 49-room, two-storey wing, and the first Governor-General of the new Confederation of Canada, Viscount Monk, took up residence. The property was purchased outright by the Crown in 1868 for 82,000 Canadian dollars, and Rideau Hall became the centre of the official life of Canadian society. One of the biggest additions to Rideau Hall was made in 1913, with the construction of the mapping block as a link between the ballroom and other parts of the residence, which now forms the main front of the building. The facade of the block features a relief of the Royal Coat of Arms, which can be seen in this photograph, and it's said to be one of the largest Royal Coat of Arms in the Commonwealth. The formal double height ballroom was added at the time of Canada's third governor general, the Earl of Dufferin in the 1870s. And it sees many of the formal large scale ceremonies that take place at Rideau Hall, such as investitures and state banquets. Its powder blue walls and elaborate ceiling and cornicing were restored in 2005, bringing back the original colors of the room from the period that it was built. The ballroom also contains a large Waterford crystal chandelier weighing over one tonne and covered in 12,000 crystals, which was presented by the British government in 1951 in recognition of Canada's central role in the Second World War. You can also see here the tent room with its distinctive red and white striped walls and ceiling, which is the setting for small receptions and events although it was originally designed as an indoor tennis court. Rideau Hall is also one of the few places outside of Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle in the Commonwealth that has military sentries outside and a formal changing of the guard ceremony. One of my favorite anecdotes about Rideau Hall is that the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who stayed at Rideau Hall several times arrived there in 1940 for a series of meetings. While staying at the residence, he is said to, to have continued to direct British wartime activities. And even when a British cabinet meeting took place in London, he was linked by telephone from his bed. And I can just imagine him sat up in bed, smoking a cigar and directing the cabinet over the phone. In conclusion, the many current government houses across the Commonwealth have played host to distinguished visitors and members of the royal family in their long histories and have been a vital link between the Crown and the people. Many of these official residences are facing the constant challenges of maintaining a heritage building, often in very harsh climates, while still retaining their prestige and uniqueness. 
Yet at the same time, they're all at the center of their nation, territory, province or state's official life, and are members of a unique group of residences in the world. Finally, I've enjoyed researching the histories of all of the current government houses in the Commonwealth, which feature in my recently published book. There are over 50 of these official residences from across the world featured, including all of the residences that I have briefly talked about today. And this book is available to purchase on my website. I'm also researching a second follow-up book on the many former and lost government houses across the world, including former viceregal residences in Hong Kong, Jerusalem, Fiji, Northern Ireland, South Africa, Sri Lanka and India, to name just a few. If anyone listening has any photographs uh, from these former residences in their archives, then please do get in touch. I'd be very uh, pleased to hear from you. I thank you for your very kind attention and to the Commonwealth Heritage Forum for inviting me to speak to you today. Jeffrey, thank you very much indeed for what was uh, an absolutely fascinating talk um, uh, on a subject that I'm passionate about myself. Um, and it's just so interesting to hear some of the anecdotes associated with, with many of the buildings. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So um, if I can sort of pass them on to you. Um, Alison has actually asked, well, what is your favourite building and why? Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a question I get asked quite often, actually. Um, I think my favourite is probably um, Government House in, in Melbourne, um, just because of the sheer scale and size of it. Um, as you saw, it, 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 was, it, was, um, it was based on a design very similar to Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Um, and it's just a magnificent residence. I, I have had the, I've been lucky in, in some of my travels to visit some of these government houses, not, not all of them, um, that's still an ambition, um, but uh, I did visit quite a few of the government houses in Australia, um, and Government House in Melbourne is, is one, of, one, of, one of my favourites. Um, I have to say I have a, a, a second favourite, um, also in Australia, which is um, one that I didn't talk about uh, this evening, which is called Admiralty House, uh, and Admiralty House is in, in Sydney, um, it was right on Sydney Harbour, um, overlooking the Sydney Harbour Bridge and uh, the Sydney Opera House um, and is the, actually the second residence of the Governor General uh, of Australia. Um, a very historic residence was the, uh, was the home of the, uh, the British Admirals of the Fleet who were based um, in Sydney um, and again that's a, just a wonderful house and, and wonderful location. Jeffrey, if I can uh, pitch another one at you, and that's, um, have you visited all 50 that, um, that you mentioned? So uh, I visited, um, I visited about um, 10 or 12 of the 50, so I've still got a lot more to visit. Um, through my work with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, I've been to uh, a couple of uh, government houses on official visits, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, I did take some time in uh, Australia and New Zealand, um, um, before I, I started my sort of professional career um, and did some traveling and visited some of the government houses. I had a very funny, funny story in, uh, in New Zealand, actually. I was traveling around New Zealand um, as, a, as a, a backpacker uh, and came across a, a function. Um, it was actually um, a, a street marathon that was starting um, and the Governor General of New Zealand was there um, firing the starting pistol and starting this, this uh, street marathon. Um, and so uh, being a plucky um, young student, um, I took the opportunity and went up and, uh, and introduced myself uh, to the Governor General um, of New Zealand. And I asked her if I could visit Government House in Wellington. Um, and she was very gracious and said, uh, no problem, uh, and gave me uh, uh, some details for her staff. And so when I was in uh, Wellington um, in New Zealand, I was able to visit uh, Government House there, which again is a it's a wonderful residence built in, in 1910 um, and has some, some wonderful architectural features. Okay, a few more questions if you don't mind. Um, Gary has actually uh, submitted a question which says, uh, 
to ask you really what do you feel the future holds for government houses generally? So I think um, I think they're they're pretty secure in 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 what they do. Um, whether they are government houses in the future, uh, time will tell. I, I, you know, my, my own personal view about you know the the Commonwealth realms, um, you know, and whether they still remain part of the the crown. Um, I, I think that that will change in the future, and so I imagine that a lot of these government houses will become uh, the official residence of the president or the governor of uh, independent uh, states uh, and countries within the Commonwealth. Um, so that has happened already um, in places like um, Dominica, um, in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago, their government houses are now the president's house. Um, and what often happens is, although they they become the president's house and, and obviously take on uh, a di slightly different role, um, so often a lot of their heritage features are maintained um, as part of the heritage of the house. Um, so uh, hopefully, I think they will be secure, um, although they may be under a different name in the future. Okay, can I just, can I just comment on that because um, it's a, you know, it's a really relevant question and that's that um, the forum has been working actually with a um, uh, uh, founding patron on government house in Antigua and the restoration program for that. One of the challenges there in, in the West Indies of course is, is recurrent hurricane damage. Um, um, we're giving some thought to how one can uh, through the forum provide some guidance and advice on strengthening the existing historic structures to make them more resilient. But um, anyway, more questions from, from others. Um, Francis Maud, who's our Deputy Chairman, wanted to ask, um, could you just say a little bit more perhaps about how much government houses may have been designed, perhaps people coming from Britain, but they're actually built using local craftsmen. And it's something we're very acutely aware of at the Forum about this importance of shit, a really truly shared heritage, uh, shared between the UK and uh, many of the Commonwealth realms. Absolutely. As I spoke about, you know, many of these uh, uh, many of these government houses were built by uh, often uh, with designs that came perhaps from the UK, um, but using local uh, craftspeople, um, certainly local materials. Um, it was a lot of the government houses in um, in this collection are um, they have they have a mixture of uh, local um, local materials that they've used, um, obviously what was available at the time. Um, and then often I'm amazed by the amount of uh, materials that were shipped in uh, and transported from, um, from the UK and from other parts of the world um, to these different locations in order to, to, you know, to build these government houses. Um, it was really quite remarkable considering the vast majority of them were, you know, were built in the, you know, the 18th, 19th, early 20th centuries um, at a time when transportation wasn't quite what it is today. Um, and so uh, the fact that these uh, building materials were being shipped around uh, around the Commonwealth um, uh, to, to, in order to build these different residences, I think is quite remarkable. And, and as you say, it's one of the unique things about these particular uh, residences is that they, they have this, this mixture of local, uh, local materials and local craftspeople, as well as uh, influences from uh, around the world. Uh, two more, if you don't mind, <laughs> they're flooding in. Okay. Um, Karen B um, is asking, have you ever looked into the government housing in the United States before the revolution? So some early colonial architecture there. Yes, I, I'm, I, I did sort of start to, to look into that. As I, as I mentioned, I've got a whole group of former government houses um, that I'm looking at now for, for my second book. Um, but the yeah the executive mansions as they were called um, in America, um, there are some very interesting governors' residences and governors' mansions, um, particularly in the early um, the early states of the United States. Um, and, and again, that would be a whole interesting um, piece of research to to look at those uh, government houses. I, I have to confess I don't know much about them as yet, um, but uh, but certainly one to look at. Work in progress then. Work. <laughs> All right. um, one more perhaps. Um, 
And uh, this is from Andrew Tuggy, who said, um, again, excellent talk. Thanks very much indeed. But have you ever been to government houses in Lahore and elsewhere in the subcontinent? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, um, no, no, I haven't yet. Um, I've, I've never been to, to India. Uh, I've never, I, I did have a uh, good fortune to go with the CPA to, to Bangladesh, but, uh, but didn't get to see uh, the former government house there. But again, there's a whole huge group of, of residences across um, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, that, um, th that were used, at, you know, particularly at the time of the, the British Empire. Um, including the, you know, the, the, the most famous is probably um, now the president's house um, in India, the president of India's residence, um, which was built by Edward Lutyens. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a vast palace of a house. Um, and it was recently featured in the film, The Viceroy's House. Um, it was a, a recent film that came out. Um, and that particular residence was featured in that, res in that film. That, that's probably a very topical point to, to perhaps finish on in that um, one of the issues that's exercising the forum at the moment, and indeed many other people, particularly in India, is, is the current president's proposals for the redevelopment of the Raj path right the way through the centre of New Delhi and um, the buildings in and around, or rather around the Viceroy's house and the, uh, the secretariats there. Um, and the real risk there is that both the Viceroy's house and the Secretariat's may be just left as white elephants. And we got some coverage in the Sunday Times online last weekend about this. So um, there, are, there are much wider issues going on there of which this is just one aspect, but uh, it's, it's a good, good point perhaps to finish on because it is very topical, very timely. But I mean, can I just, just thank you hugely, Geoffrey, for an absolutely fascinating talk. I mean, it's a shame we can't do a round of applause, actually, but you can give you a virtual round of applause, I think. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, oh, I've got a copy of the book here, and I would strongly recommend it to everyone who's listening in. I mean, it is absolutely fascinating, and it's a really neglected area of, um, of research into, if you like, Britain's global heritage. So um, do, do get a copy, I'd thoroughly recommend it. Um, just a couple of other things before we uh, wind up. The, uh, this is the first of a series of talks that the forum will be giving. Um, the next, uh, I believe, will be on um, the 18th of February, which uh, our Deputy Chairman, uh, Francis Maud, will be uh, delivering on the restoration of, uh, I think, the Temperate House at Kew. Um, but there will be others as well in the series, and we're also uh, working closely with the Commonwealth Association of Architects, Commonwealth Association of Planners, and other Commonwealth bodies on delivering some uh, joint webinars prior to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in June. So um, lots of interesting uh, things to uh, anticipate, uh, lots of interesting topics that we'll be covering, so please do Join us again. We'll be circulating details of these uh, both uh, on our, in our newsletters, on our website, and individually to um, people, to our members. So thank you all very much indeed for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Geoffrey. <laughs>